It's Dable and Allen together again. Does anything change? And should it? Plus, does an offense need balance? And training camp stays in Buffalo. Will it ever come back to St. John Fisher? All that's coming up on this week's edition of the Buffalo Plus Podcast. All right, welcome back to the Buffalo Plus Podcast presented by buffaloplus.com. Mike Catalana, girl dad, Dan Fates. I am Jenna Cottrell. The OTAs week three, we had Brian Dable, Josh Allen back on the field together. We talked to Brian Dable this week about the offense, about the evolution. Um, we all asked about you know the expectations on this team. And, and Mike, we were talking about just this, this group together with Dable and Allen how important that continuity is, and then also if there's anything that should be worked on because th these two have been working together for a little bit of time now. Yeah, I think Dable, you know, he highlighted a lot of things like, you know, communication and, and knowing mm -hmm. what each other has done and the familiarity. And he's saying, you know, we can go back to what we did last year, and you reference that. And I think all that is positive. I also think he's a smart guy, and I think he's an effective coach. Mm -hmm. And I think there are moments where he's going to do it a different way or he's going to not snap back at Josh, but let's just say that's a normal conversation. Yeah, yeah, I got it. And he's like, boom, boom, boom. What did I? What do I want here? What do I want there? I think he'll find ways to even push or test Josh Allen, um, maybe even with the whole team there. The, the idea being like, you better be ready. You better know things. And I think you need to do that even <clears throat> with Josh Allen, as well as he knows the offense and all the things yeah. he's improved in. Uh, it can become where you just sort of say something and, yeah, I get it, and then move on. Yeah. It, there needs to be teaching. There needs to be ways to highlight <laughs> things that they didn't do as well last year. So uh, I think Brian Dable is very well aware. I'll say this. The pluses, Dan, far outweigh the minuses of this continuity. Yeah, and – he was addressed. Mike, you asked him about, you know, Sean McDermott had said that sometimes messages can become stale. Yeah. Dable acknowledged that that fact, too. And, and I think Dable also, I asked him about managing expectations. And, and it's something I think we've talked about in this podcast before mm -hmm. where, and it's kind of, we've, we've talked about it up at OTAs a couple of times with, with, with other members of the media, that more often than not, guys, the, the probability of Josh taking a step back statistically is very high. Like, like in all reality, Josh Allen can have a great year. The Bills offense mm -hmm. can have a great year. And they still may not put up franchise-setting numbers like they did last season. Like, So I, I wanted to know how, how you balance that. That, it, that if they only score 24 points a game the first few weeks of the season, like, is that different? And, and he said it is. And Dable added that there's, there's 15 new players. There's new relationships to build. Even though there is all this mm -hmm. continuity that we look at, there are new faces that, that are going to add to this team. So it's an... Uh, something that, I, that I'm looking at is, is just to know that last year there was there was hope that this offense would be better, but as I've joked around about, it was harder for the offense to be worse in 2020 than it was in 2029. Yeah. Now yeah. they have to live up to what they did in 2029, and that's tricky. Yeah, and Jenna, that's what I wanted to add into this. They can say what they want about starting over and it's a new year. That's not the way it's going to play out. I no. mean, Dan's point is that if they only score 20-some points on the lower end – the headlines, and now they're a team that gets the headlines Get on. Headlines, you know, yeah. Yeah, NFL Network and, you know, uh, Screaming A and all those shows, like whatever they're doing, right? Is it, What's wrong with the Bills' offense? Mm -hmm. Think about it. The Bills could be scoring 24 points a game, and it'd be like, eh, they, they don't look the same. I, I mean, that's natural. And even in the building, we can say what we want about it's a new year and every year is different. No, they set the bar up high. Yep. They really yeah. did. And now, like, to Dan saying, okay – you may not be at the quite the level all the time that you were last year right. and still be really good. I mean, mm -hmm. Patrick Mahomes wasn't quite at the same level all the time. He's still Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. But you can take a step back. But yeah, they've raised the bar. The expectations are there. Whether they want to address it publicly or not, they expect mm -hmm. to do the same and more this year. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I feel like every year the goalpost does move back. And the talk of, you know, we wipe the clean sling, we turn the page, like you hear every cliche in the book. Because, yes, there are absolutely new players that are added and other players that leave. But at the same point, again, I mean, this there's no way that these expectations won't be so high on the Bills. And I, I wonder how, as a team that's been together for so long, you do approach that because you know – Again, this team is going to get everyone's best as well. I feel like last year they kind of could sneak up on teams, but now this year they're in the headlines, they're making headlines, and people have the expectations that, 
okay, I'm going to have to give it my all to beat this team. And Jen, that's a great point because it's that fine line between, hey, let's get even better. Let's score 40 points a game this year (laughs) while also not realizing that the expectations are so massive. And Jenna, I thought you made a great point heading into this draft and heading into this offseason. After an offseason where Brandon Bean got Stephon Diggs and was named the NFL Executive of the Year, you were like, there's more pressure on him now to keep doing these things. <laughs> like, like, like now it's like Bean, hey man, like you got to keep nailing these draft picks because you've been so successful with mm-hmm. Gabe Davis and Tyler Bass and all these guys where it's like, hey, you're not all, it's almost like you're not allowed to miss. Like if the Bills were to That's score, how I feel. And also now, that's why I worry about for Josh Allen because I, I think now it's a little different with Josh that. Allen. I think it's a little different, Josh Allen, but but I think the team as a whole, you know, there may be a game this year where they score 10 or 13 points and they only score one touchdown. And, we, yeah. and we, we're going to get on this podcast here on buffaloplus.com. Be sure to like and subscribe. <laughs> and we're going to be going, what the heck's wrong with these guys? Like, come on. Like, when were they, you know, they were, they were scoring 40 points a game. They set franchise record in points, franchise yeah. record in 30 point games. And Josh pretty much rewrote the record books for a quarterback for the franchise. So it is funny how we are sitting here talking about that this is going to be the expectations are even higher this year um with with what they've built and, and it comes with the territory general you said of, of being good yeah and even brian dable talked about today and this is no secret this is talked about in the nfl like it is a what have you done for me lately type of business we have a very short memory when it comes to success but also we like to push things down the road and talk about how important things are now mike you have a kind of unique um spot that you're in because Dan and I have been working for you for a while, me longer than Dan, but like, how do you, cause there are times where I'm definitely like, okay, Mike, I kind of like blow off what you say, but how do you <laughs> connect as a leader, as someone who. It's is- just, that's just her, Mike. I listen to everything you say. I'm so thankful to be employed by you. I, like, you're the best no, boss I, ever. I mean, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stick my foot directly in my mouth. But you know what I mean. Because the sentiment, you're motivating people. You want them to grow. But at the same point, these are people that you've worked with for a while. And they kind of know the tendencies of how you communicate. I think there's different ways to motivate. I think, you know, once you have the trust of people, uh, they trust you, you trust them. uh, Mm -hmm. I think you should be able to criticize because it comes with the idea of success we've had. And... You know, I, I heard this story um, about Mike Shashevsky. Uh, I think it was was Jay uh, was Jay Billis was talking about him, and he said, uh, you know, when Shashevsky first started, uh, he would just scream at everybody. And Billis was at a practice, and he's like, Shashevsky just lit him up when he was a player. How dumb he was, what you did, and blah blah blah. So it fast forwards to recent time. This was in the 2010, somewhere around there, and one Can't of his one of the yeah, one of the players uh, had made some mistakes, and Billis was watching film. And he's like, oh, man, this dude's going to get lit up right here by Shashevsky. And you know what he said to the guy? He said, uh, great players don't do what you just did there. Don't do that again. Ooh. And that is a very different way to motivate. That's when you already have the trust of the guy. You are mm-hmm. basically saying to him, you're great or you're close to great. And I know what great is and great guys don't take shortcuts. And I, and Bill has sat there and go, man, this guy is good. And he really wow. is. And I, and I do think yeah. that is a way, you know, Josh Allen has established. Now, what do the greats do? They do it year in, year out, year in, yeah. year out. But to Dan's point on that, even when you look at the greats, Joe Montana, Tom Brady, all these guys, Jim Kelly, Every year was not a statistical rise up. It's not always yeah. just there they go. You know, there's times you're like, oh, you threw a lot of picks this year. I didn't have as many touchdowns and whatever it is. So you have to know how to deal with that. But I do think it's about trust <laughs> and honesty and the ability to do that. By the way, I have a few notes for you, too. I'll go over them okay, after good. we're off we'll the say. air. Yeah. To make well, sure, well, Mike, I'm mad you're disappointed. Mike, yeah, well, that, that, I was just—I literally wrote that note down. That's like when the when you ask your dad or something like that. He's like, "I'm not mad at you. I'm just disappointed." And you're like, "That cuts way worse." Way it is. Worse. I would just rather have you be way mad at me. <laughs> well, it, it is, but you're at the same time to use the Shashevsky example. You're saying you didn't do what the greats standard. do. I think you can be great. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm reading into his words, but he's saying right. No, yeah, I, I wouldn't be saying that. You wouldn't be saying he's not saying that same thing to uh, to Jake Fromm, 
right? Yeah. Jake Fromm's just trying to stay on a roster. He's saying that to Josh Allen, who is his quarterback, and they've had that success. And think about it. You know, I go back to when you guys know, you. one of you two probably got the shot of Brian Dayball. It was, I think, the Bengals game when Josh made the comeback and, and yeah. they won the game. And he's – and Josh didn't have, like, a great game, but they won. <laughs> And he's so excited for him. At that moment, Josh is young, he's new, and he needs that success. Well, he ain't that guy anymore. He needs success. No more training wheels. Yes, and the success is higher. So I think there's different ways to do it. I trust Dable in that way, as Dan mentions. You know, we're all on board with Dave's here. Um, He did everything asked of him and should have gotten a head coaching job. But he didn't. Yeah. But I think he's all in right now, back with his team, and hopefully he gets the opportunity that he deserves while he's helping Josh get to that next step. Well, another thing we talked about too with Brian Dable was just the passing game, the run game, and the <laughs> balance that you need between the two. And Dan, if you're if you're listening to this, is cracking his neck getting ready because I'm gonna imagine he has some some opinions. Oh, he's on this. so excited How much about balance what he said. Do you need. Dan, what do you think of it? Well, the line of the day today from Brian Dable's Zoom call was balance is great when you win. It's not so great when you lose, which is so it, – it's it was almost like Brian yeah, Dable – might get that tattooed. <laughs> yeah, like, like it was just so perfect because we've asked him for the last – I wrote the, the article on buffaloplus.com was that we've pretty much been talking about the running game for 13, 14, 15 months. Just they, they, they never got it going last year. We talked about it leading up to the draft. We, 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 we pretty much talked about it at nauseum. And it got to the point where Dable's like, yeah, it, would it be cool if we ran the ball and lost? Like, like, like is that what you guys want? And, yeah. you know, he said, he goes, but he, what he did say, and I think is so true, is that he talked about being efficient. And you need to be efficient at what you need to do when you need to do it. And that hit home where he's like, there are going to be games where if we think we need to throw the ball 30 times in a row, we're going to throw the ball 30 times in a row. But I'm, you know, you can also take the converse side of that, Jenna, as if we need to run the ball, we have to be able to do it. He's not saying we have to run it more. He's saying we have to run it better, which is something mm-hmm. I, I have agreed with because I would rather have them have 10 runs that are effective and efficient than 10 runs that go nowhere. Because then in that case, I'd rather... Th- have those 10 runs be passes i think mike and i were trying to drive home that point of being exactly. efficient and able to do you guys it do a good job at it no I, i'm pretty <laughs> sure i use the exact word efficient multiple times You're like no it doesn't it doesn't matter well, you don't run move through josh allen's arm you don't have to worry about running the ball i agree with you and i loved brian dable's comment about oh this is you know balance is great when you're winning but not when you're losing i agree the thing was, the Bills were not efficient running the ball Correct. last year. And that is why this year there are going to be so many questions because you have to be able to win multiple ways in the NFL. Yes. And so I would I say the this. Balance, but yeah. at some point, look, I'm not saying every game run it down their throats, old school football. I'm just saying in a point where it's inevitable, Josh Allen is not going to have a good game at one point for one reason or another. Absolutely. Maybe you have a backup quarterback in. You hope that's not the case. But there are situations that will arise, and you need to be able to gain yards. And they really struggled to do that on the Yeah, court. and and it does also. You know, you talk to any offensive lineman. I mean, the game has changed, and they build mm. the lines around pass blocking. But there are moments where, man, backing up and taking on defensive ends, it gets old after a while. And they do want sure. to – they do want to – knock somebody over and mm-hmm. and clear holes and run the ball. And yeah, moving the clock. You know what moves the clock is getting first downs. But there are times you don't want to put the ball in the air. You don't want to take the risk and you want to be able to do it. And I do think there is uh, b- balance becomes, like Dan says, you run and when you do, you may be, you may be able to, let's just say, like D- Jenna says, Josh gets off to a rough start. He's struggling mm-hmm. a little bit. Or for some reason it ends up being that Mitchell Trubisky is playing in a game, right? For whatever reason, a small injury or, you know, whatever it is. And he's in the game and your faith in the passing game might still be pretty good, but it's not what it is with Josh Allen and you're able to do it. And I do think the Buccaneers are a good example of that. Mm -hmm. It is a passing offense. It is what they want to do. But when they had those moments, they could gash people with the running game. And then they're sitting back going, oh, God because we ran over them a few times. Not 
40 carries. And by the way, the Bills don't have Derrick Henry in the background, in the yeah, backfield, correct. where you can just say, we're just going to physically maul you. That's not what they're trying to do. Yeah. Right. And, and to two of Mike's points, that was my favorite stat, and I, I've said it a bunch of times, the fact that everybody goes, well, the, the Bucks were the most balanced team in the NFL this year. That's why they won the Super Bowl. You have to be a balanced team. You don't have to be a balanced team. The Bucs, and Brian Dable said it, they were second in the NFL in passing yards per game and 28th in rushing yards during the regular season. They weren't a great running team. They ran the ball well for four games at the end of the season. That is what happens. And to your guys' point, as you guys have always said to me, you need to be able to run the ball in January, in February, when the yeah. weather gets bad, and players are worn down physically. I agree with all of those things. But as I was saying last year, and I will say it to my dying breath, was that Josh was hot, was as hot as any quarterback has been in Buffalo, and you couldn't run the ball, so it was a waste of a down to run it. Now, oh. if they get things if they get things figured out this year and can run it more effectively, that's fine. Instead of my instead of my dream of 50 passes per game, I would be okay with 41. But <laughs> Uh, th that was what it was last year was again, if they can run the ball more effectively, sure. But the bills were the f number one ranked team in the league in passing on first downs. Like they kept defenses off balance play action still works. Even if you can't run the ball, don't listen to what old school varsity football head coaches, three letter coach th varsity letter guy <laughs> would, would tell you. Um, but that, that, that was where I came from last year where hey. I really planted my feet in and dug in. Jenna. Yeah. Mike, I'm I'm gonna jump you one you second. Go ahead. Mike, because I wanted to just point out that Dan's argument had a, a topic sentence, it had a thesis, and it had an in conclusion. So we really <laughs> appreciate that because you came prepared, I can tell. He did. He was ready. <laughs> uh you know, I, I think one of the guys who really changed the game, and he doesn't get enough credit for it, he gets credit for being a great coach and doing a lot of things, is Andy Reid. Because when Andy Reid started, even with the Eagles back in the 2000s and then certainly carried it into Kansas City, uh, Andy would run the ball. I mean, he had LaShawn McCoy. Like, he had guys who could run it. He's always had good running backs. But he comes out throwing, puts pressure on the other team. Basically, and the game was even a little different then, but he's getting the lead on you and then use his running game. But it's the pressure you put on another team is with the passing game. And I, it used to be a given it was like death taxes and teams run on second and 10. And it's, yeah. it's like, you would say, we need to be in more manageable third down. Right. And if you thought about it, the way the game was played before you say, we threw an incompletion on first, second and 10, we got it to third and six that it, that, okay. Yeah. 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 In 2021, third and six, third and eight, third and nine, third and 10. Now <laughs> you don't want to be third and 14. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because that does change things. You know, the whole behind the sticks, but I say, you know, Andy Reid sort of got into that mode of using the passing game to sort of set up eventually the running game. And so to the point of being able to do it, that's why I say is it was a given. Second and 10, hand it off. Yeah. And when you still see so teams do that, you're like, man, you are, you're living in, in, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I do yeah. think I want to see times with these backs where everybody expects them to pass and you gouge somebody with a 15 yep. yard gain yeah. because they are fully expecting to pass in a spread offense. So that was the part I think that maybe concerned me maybe the most was this was an awesome passing team that never really did anything on the run. So I want to see more. Even of that. when people yeah. knew they were going to throw the ball. I that know that's the part. Yes. yes. Like they had a lot of light boxes because of spreading teams out right. and they still couldn't run it. So yeah. they need, okay. Breath. I need to, he's good. Yeah. Deep breath. He's good. Deep yeah, breath. Yeah, good. Say. Good. You need a minute. Um, no, I'm good. All right, training camp is going to be back in Buffalo again this year for the second straight season. Brandon Bean spoke to the media this week saying the decision was made basically because logistically it was too heavy of a lift to have camp in Rochester at St. John Fisher College. Um, Mike, you've covered camp at Fisher. Camp has been at Fisher since 2000 before the last two years, but how do you feel? Does that make you concerned about camp coming back to Rochester? I, I'm concerned about it. No blame at all being put on McDermott or Bean. Look, if these guys didn't want camp, they wouldn't even have been approaching it. Mm -hmm. Last year, I told you guys, and we all we reported it, they wanted camp at Fisher. And obviously, when we look back on it, there was zero chance of having yeah. it. They were pushing for it this year. They wanted it. And then it gets shut down. What my worry is, now you'll have gone two straight years 
Mm-hmm. The Bills facilities are outstanding. Yes, they're mm-hmm. nice at Fisher, but Fisher used to have better facilities almost than in Orchard Park back when they yeah. started, when they didn't yeah. have a lot of stuff. But when you're in Orchard Park now, you've got the rehab facility. You've got the bubble to practice if there's storms. You have mm-hmm. the multiple fields. You have total control over it. So yeah. while they were trying to do it, uh, the logistical part just sort of made them go, we can't. Could they go back? Of course. And if I put it this way, if Sean McDermott still believes it is an advantage for his team, he will do it. I just wonder if there's a point where they say, look at what we've done. What if this team goes and wins the Super Bowl this year? And you go, really? The last two years, we started out at home. We went to the AFC Championship. The next year, we won the Super Bowl. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, And camp has obviously changed a lot. Um It does concern me only because these guys really wanted to do it. Circumstances kept them there, and it almost put them in a spot that's like, okay, guys, this is what we have. Do you really want to go back? Yeah. Yeah. Jenna, I was going to remind this kind of conversation, and again, to Mike's point, and that it was out of being in McDermott's hands, obviously with COVID and, and the restrictions, and Brandon being reiterated twice, and I think it's important to note that this had zero to do with vaccinations. We see yeah. all of your comments, guys, that you post on these videos. This isn't a, a vaccine podcast or a, or a YouTube channel or anything like that, but it is part of what the discussion is. And it was, you know, Brandon Bean kind of shut that down for yeah. um, any concerns of that. But I wonder if, guys, how much the players will have input moving forward because now the Bills are essentially a free agent in training camp. And Jenna, I remember you and I were up at training kit or up at a practice two years ago and we were talking to a player and and he ranted and raved about how great the ownership was and how great the coaches were at listening to players and how Mike and Jenna, you guys remember when, when, when it was first few seasons of McDermott and even Rex, they had early practices like seven, eight AM. And then all of a sudden practices got moved back. Mm -hmm. McDermott was much more accommodating. Players had veterans had certain days off a lot of these things. And, and Bean made the comment about it and joked about it, that his bed is comfier at home, (laughs) but he likes the camaraderie. And he said that, you know, he goes, you ask 25 guys, 25 say they love going away to, or you ask 50 guys, 25 love going to camp, 25 love staying at their home. Yeah. Mike shakes his head. I don't think it's that many. I think it's probably like, for like going to get I would say this, and this is not a negative towards Fisher. I'll put it to you no. this way. I mean, I go back to when they were at Fredonia, but it was a different world. Fredonia was yeah. just they were brutally hot. Days. Six yeah. weeks. They were practicing them like crazy. That was what every NFL team did. It's already become where it's a limited amount of, yes. you know, and, and plus they have the whole, there's the whole secretive practice issue. They can limit us and the times, even if we're out there, they limit the amount of times we can shoot. If there's no fans there, they don't have to worry about any of that. They don't have to worry about the Patriots because we know the Patriots have a spy at every practice, (laughs) you know, shooting practice. Oh, believe me, I had Greg Williams. I was in Greg Williams' office, one of the first camps, and he's like – and I was like – I th- I was like, really? He's like, well, we know the Patriots have had people here, and this is what we worry about. And I'm like – Wow, this is I'm thinking they're paranoid. And then, of course, every other coach has said the same thing about paranoid about. T- so it's different in that way and what they can do in terms of the players. And I'm and look, I've lived here for 30 plus years. You guys are here. We love when they come to Fisher. It's great. Mm-hmm. The interaction with the fans. But as a player now with the facilities you have in Buffalo, I don't know. Now, look, they probably like some of the stuff where the families yeah. get to come watch and yeah. all that stuff. And. And they, you know, what percentage of them go, this is awesome. Everybody gets to come watch. Maybe, I, you know, so, so that's yeah. great. But to, to your point, if they ask the players what they would rather have, yeah. I think they might say I'd rather stay in Buffalo. Well, I think, too, what we could kind of see is what we've already seen in the trend with Sean McDermott. They had, when they did have camp Bingo. Fisher, there weren't as many days at Fisher. It wasn't the Bingo. whole summer at Fisher. Like with Rex Ryan, it was like, you know, three full weeks of being at Fisher. Whereas with Sean McDermott, it was a couple weeks here, a couple practices in Buffalo, the, you know, the blue and white scrimmage in Buffalo, things like that. I think there's a way to make it work where you can have the team be in Rochester for a little bit, yep. have the facilities that are not quite as nice, but still very nice and have the fans there and then have the ability to also be back at your, your home facility have everything that comes with that. 
that would be to me a win-win because yeah. you're able to pick off pieces of both parts that you really enjoy. Now, yeah. logistically speaking, my one thing is, and Brandon Bean kind of t- t- talked about this of how, you know, they have to bring some of the stuff from the team facility in Orchard Park to Rochester, how that would work. And maybe that makes it kind of a, a situation where it doesn't make sense. But if you look at it from the outside, not knowing the, all the logistics behind it, that to me would kind of be a way to appease everyone. And also <clears throat> that you can have that, you know, team bonding, camaraderie, yep. ability to have fans. Because let's be real. I mean, being in the stadium, trying to figure out how they're going to have open practices, um, which Brandon Bean said they're hopeful to have fans in the stands for some of the practices this summer at training camp. But, you know, it, it just makes it that much more of a headache where at Fisher, you kind of already know the layout. You know how things go. Yeah. Um, I mean, you I look think, around. Look I around the league. I was just going to say, because the trend has been, you know, mm-hmm. not to go away. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and a lot of teams have done that. I mean, the Jets used to go to Cortland and, you yeah, know, the, the Patriots. Yeah, the Giants go to SUNY Albany. Right. And the Patriots are at home and the Eagles went to Widener and then to Lehigh and they'd have these huge crowds. And now they have about three or four practices, raise some money for charity, have them in the stadium. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then couple of times they allow some sponsors and season ticket holders through a lottery mm-hmm. to come. Yeah. It's very limited. It's not quite what we've seen. Um, look, I want them to come back. I think it's been great. Yeah. It's right here for us. And I, I that. like that the fans get the road. <laughs> Yeah, But here's the thing, too. Even if they were to come this year, and I was told this, I don't even think they got to the point of talking really about the fans. Like, mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. if fans were have been allowed at camp, which could have been on a sort of, you know, look how close. I mean, we, we've got all this video. You know, you've seen it. Josh is there taking pictures, people hugging him, pr- yeah. you know, asking him to go to the prom, like everything that's going on. Forgot I don't think that. we would have had any of that this year. Now, maybe next year that would be different. Correct. And mm-hmm. so maybe there is a way to do this. And maybe it's maybe it's a week. Maybe it's one week early in camp. They do it right away. Like I don't know. Yeah. And that would be great. I I would be great. I just worry that it's transitioning that way into staying at home. But I think it's transitioned, as Jenna pointed out really well, the fact of, again, players getting their way while McDermott also gets his way of building team camaraderie, having everybody kind of together and having those campfire conversations and, and all of those team activities that they've really enjoyed doing. So I think that's a great point that Jenna makes of just the fact of, They've already trimmed it back. Thank you. You're welcome. I um, I don't think it's – I know people have been like, well, they're, they're going to keep trimming it back, and they're just going to keep trimming it back. They're going to keep trimming it back. I think it's the, – they were finding a really nice balance mm-hmm. of still connecting with the fans, being around the fans, which the players really do enjoy, that they do get those team bonding. Jordan Poyer said it best. He was asked about training camp all stuff, and he's like, I like them both. You get all the team facilities in Buffalo, you get the camaraderie in Rochester. Like, I, I like both things. So I think if they can continue to do both things, I think they will continue to do it. And, you know, maybe we'd talk to our Mr. Greg Connors. You know, maybe he has a little bit of an insight. Yeah, yeah that's very true as well. I mean, it, it's going to be – it would be great to have the team be back in Rochester just because that's they're, what I – mean, Because we, they're – In Rochester, like, we obviously would yeah. love to have that. But I think – even the fact that they've been away for as long as they have so many other teams made that move, that decision to go away, to, to go back to their team facility so long ago. So the, the fact that we're even talking about this, I think is says a lot and, about the team. And Jenna, to work. how about the fact that they're good? <laughs> yeah. I mean, most of the years they've been here, uh, you know, yeah. they started out the first year of camp. Wade was the coach and they were coming off the Music City Miracle. Yep. And the drought began. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like at least they made the playoffs a couple of years when they had yeah. camp at Fisher. So we can't get blamed for that. They ended the drought That's when it was true. a camp That's year true. at Fisher. 2017 because it was McCormick 2017 first, yeah. and 28. Yeah, in both years they made the playoffs. They had camp was, here. Now they did make the you know, AFC. Yeah. Yeah. Peterman was the last camp, right? No. What? Well, he was the starter coming out of camp. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. No, no, wait a minute. No, no I don't think no. so. It was the next it year. Was Josh, it was Josh and Josh year. Because yeah. it was the year they ended up playing in uh, Houston playoffs. The first yes. year was Josh's first year. It was Josh's second and, year. 
Yeah. And then the third year they make the AFC yeah, championship. You're right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because I remember so his that. first camp. His first camp when he was the rookie, and it was like, oh, Josh Allen. And then his second camp talk to when he was the starter, and it was like, oh my god, Josh. Do you, do you remember that? We weren't allowed to talk to him. Yeah. Because, as, as the Bills media said, you uh, there's no media availability for the third string quarterback because that's what he was in the depth chart we until talk half to- until half time <laughs> of the first game <laughs> <laughs> when they were down eighty to three or whatever it was yeah. against the Raiders. In Baltimore. Oh my God. Yeah. And they traded AJ McCarron right before the start of the season. Yeah, AJ McCarron preseason MVP. Yeah, oh training my God. camp MVP. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into it <laughs> as well because uh, there was a little scuffle. So OTAs going on. There's a little yeah. scuffle on the field. OTAs. Um, I guess there was AJ and Vanessa did a pick of Josh Allen and John Feliciano was a little upset, a little dust up. Um, Dan, it's early. I don't mind that personally. No. I don't, what's your take on that? Well, this is the second dust up that Josh Allen's had. And the first one didn't really make as much noise. I remember telling you guys about it um, when I was up there, the first OTA. So that was May 27th. I think it was the last week of May um, where they had OTAs and they were doing red zone and Josh threw a pick and Dane Jackson picked him off. And Dane kind of was like out of bounds. And then all the, you know, it was on the defensive sideline and all the defenders are going crazy. And they're saying, run it back, run it back, run it back. And so Dane kind of starts to jog down the field. And, and Josh chased after him. And we were all kind of watching it. All the media, we had to put our cameras down. We weren't allowed to film it. But it kind of ended with Josh ripping off his helmet and kind of yelling at Dane and, and kind of getting into it. And Dane didn't back down, and they kind of exchanged words. And and I remember looking over at Matt Bovey, who's the sports director in Buffalo at our, at our uh, affiliate station, and we were like, is anybody else seeing this? Like, is anybody else seeing this? That, like, Josh was so livid about an interception. So when we heard today – that he threw another interception to AJ Epinesa, and it was John Feliciano supposedly who tracked him down, and then Felice or then Epinesa threw the football at Feliciano, and a scuffle kind of ensued. That's just the intensity, and they talked about the yeah. intensity that Stefan Diggs brought to practice. Yeah, and and that when players got to see. Diggs and Trey White go against one another in one on one. They were like that just elevated everybody's level. That like hey, Diggs is Diggs doesn't mess around. Hey, okay, so we've had two Josh Allen pick sixes so far in OTAs. Bust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was <laughs> I mean, you why would you make that? I was wondering I was what he was doing. What you were doing because you were if if you're listening to this podcast, Mike just put up a banner that said, "What's wrong with Josh?" Well, Allen. I mean, he, he was working on something because he would look very. That's going to be the headline. Intense. Let's get all the clicks we can possibly get. Well, we talked about it in the beginning, like okay, like if they're not as good, you're talking about pick sixes, AJ Epinesa, Dean Jackson. In June, how dare he? What is wrong with Josh Allen? Funny, He's not the yeah. same guy he was a year ago. Something's got to change. No. Get Trubisky on the field. <laughs> Well, like, Mike, you covered the bickering bills. And here's, oh, my, yeah. here's my take on it. Like, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, it's not – it's oh a competitive game. It's a competitive game. And I – like you said, Dan, like the, that competitiveness and, and elevating everything. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can be competitive with your best friends playing pickup basketball and get into a yeah. scuffle. Like this stuff yeah. has, it's hot. You're Harrison playing. Phillips, you get annoyed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's – Harrison Phillips says deal. brother – even brothers fight. Yeah. Well, I was like, thing, oh, yeah. <laughs> guys, the only thing that was surprising to me after hearing this was that Jerry Hughes wasn't involved because he wasn't <laughs> at OTAs. <laughs> because Jerry Hughes was involved in every single – or sorry, Gary was involved in every single training camp fight that I'd ever seen in my five or six years of covering the team. And I'll never forget, it was Leslie Frazier's first year. Oh, Jerry yeah. got in a fight, and it was clear as day. Jerry's yelling as he's going off the field, and Leslie Frazier goes, it's all about you, Jerry. It's all about you. It's whatever it is. And I'll never forget those fights. Like, when you were that close to the action. Do you remember when we talked to Trey White about that? Trey was a rookie, and he's like, I was already scared of Jerry. And then I saw Gary come out. <laughs> it's hilarious. He's like, I'm, I'm, you know, going through uh, Kyle and all these guys, and then I see Jerry, and I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> oh my god! Oh uh, yeah, that's all right. A little bit of that is fine. Please, it's yeah. nothing like the bickering bills. Those guys fought about yeah. everything, and it wasn't yeah. even. And there was always stuff in camp when you're going three yeah. a days in ninety degree weather. 
There was always yeah. something like that going on. No, I think they're fine. I don't think we got to worry about the Feliciano uh, Epinesa battles no. continuing all through camp. No, I think I think Love it'll it. be just fine in June. Something tells me. But the big me. question will be, seriously, <laughs> we got to work on what is wrong with Josh Allen and his pick sixes. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my goodness. Yeah. All right. Well, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Honestly, liking our posts really, really does help everything and subscribing. If you are subscribed, you can turn on notifications. We try and post as much as possible. We're also coming up going to do a video just about our backgrounds, how we cover the team, why we started covering the team, just where we're from, all that to help give you guys a better indication of just like, you know, how we started covering the beat um, and things like that. So be sure to leave any questions or comments you want us to address. And we always appreciate the listen from Mike Catalana and Dan Fates. I am Jenna Cottrell. We will catch you next week on another edition of the Buffalo Plus Podcast.